Okay, we have this stream going. And this. Excellent. Okay, module number five. This is all about the software assurance best practices. In prior versions of Security Plus, this was a small section. Uh, starting with this one, it actually takes greater, uh, greater scope in the test. If you've never seen this before, you've seen it now. The Software Development Life Cycle, or SDLC. It, it maps software creation from an idea to the end of a software's useful life. Software development doesn't always follow a formal model, but most cover these phases. SLDC provides a consistent framework to structure workflow and provide planning for the development process. Each model will have certain types of work and projects that fit better than others. So picking just a simple one SDLC may not always be the best choice. Essentially, you have the, the planning phase uh, where you're looking to maybe there's an alternate solution or uh, the cost. You have the analysis or requirements, the getting customer input for what desired functionality uh, is sought for, what a current system or application does or doesn't do and what improvements they want. There's the design, uh, designing the functionality, the architecture and the integration points, all that jazz. Then comes the actual coding. Then comes with testing, training and transition, the ongoing maintenance. And then at the end will be the end of life or, or uh, just getting rid of it, decommissioning. A couple of the models that are most infamous are like the waterfall, where each sequential step uh, doesn't overlap any other. So the gather requirements has to happen first, and then comes design. And once design is done, then implement. It doesn't, um, they, they don't interlap with one another. That every step is laid out. So it's good for something like a fixed scope or a known time frame. Spiral has four phases that are repeatedly visited. So this can be a little more flexible to handle changes in requirements. As customer says, maybe I want this, maybe I don't. Hey, can you add this at the last second? You have that kind of a, a chart way of doing things. Uh, there's also Agile, an iterative and incremental process. With Agile, everything is broken down into smaller units to be done quickly with, uh, with less upfront planning. Now, these are all nice and pretty little ways of taking an idea, making something, it, seeing it through its lifetime and decommissioning at the end. The problem is in all of that, security is not mentioned. Even though this is the time when we're going through these various ways of, of developing software, you notice there was no security in this. Neither that nor that. Testing is there, sure. But testing more means does the, the application, does the solution do the thing that the customer wanted, not, hey, let's test for security. In the ideal world, 
security is embedded to those cycles in the ideal world you as the security engineer the analyst is looking into those steps and ensuring that security is part of the process and again security is something we we all do all the time when you leave your house you always lock your door you close all your windows when you leave your car you you make sure that it's locked we do security all the time but for whatever reason we have the hardest time picturing security in things like coding There's the continuous integration and continuous development or CICD. It's a development practice that checks code into a shared repository on a consistent and ongoing basis. It's really automation and scripting. Security can be implemented into this building uh, validation and automated security testing into the process, as well as what the customer is looking for. That way, any flaws don't make it to production. OWASP, of course, has some um, uh, designing and uh, coding secure practices. These should be looked at. These should ideally be put into practice. But are they? Not always. Usually, no. There's also the application programming interfaces or APIs. These are interfaces between clients and servers or applications that define how a client should ask for information from a server and how the server will respond. These should be protected for proper authentication, authorization, proper data scoping, rate limiting, input filtering, appropriate monitoring and logging to, in order to remain secure. But as usual, security wasn't built in mind with this, just the feature of, hey, I can communicate using any programming language directly with the operating system. What could possibly go wrong? There are different code review models from things like pair programming, where two developers are working on one workstation, one writes, the other reviews. There's over the shoulder. Uh, again, it's a pair of developers. The writing one explains the code to the other, so it gets peer reviewed as it's being written. There's the pass around. Manual peer review done by sending completed code to reviewers to check for issues. There's the tool assisted using formal or informal software to review. Uh, this is a picture of the Fagan inspection, a structural formal code review intended to find a variety of problems during the development process. It has a specific entry and exit points for processes to ensure that every process hasn't started until the appropriate diligence has been performed. There's also the static and, and uh, static and dynamic code analysis. Static would be reviewing source code without running the program. Dynamic is uh, testing it while the program is running. Fuzzing would be sending invalid or random data to see what the application does and what kind of failures does it bring out. 
see to me as a non-programmer all these things are just just sounds super complicated and just like so convoluted to have all these different ways of creating programs and then not only that security is not even talked about we have to bring it into the conversation because it's not it's not in these processes just making throwing a, just another wrench, another thing to do and slowing the whole process down because it wasn't built in in the first place. And it wasn't built in because it's not convenient to bring in security. So the biggest problem with all these models is having people accept it, having people to do it, having the the developers be okay with adding security into everything that they're doing because otherwise security won't get looked it, it'll be forgotten it'll be something that will be implemented later and that's how we get standards and and languages and and configurations out there that don't have security in mind then get breached and then oops we got to go fix everything after the fact Another shifting gears to injection vulnerabilities. One of the more infamous is SQL injection, or as mentioned in the industry, SQL I. If you have absolutely no knowledge of SQL, in the lecture notes, I've linked a site that can help you uh, quickly catch up on how to use SQL. Because there's a quite a large number of web applications that receive input from users uh, to compose a database query that provides results that are returned to the user. Uh, if you, for example, search for anything, the web server needs to know what products in maybe a catalog to search for, sending that request to a backend database and retrieving those results. Oh, by the way, that's the site if you uh, have no knowledge of SQL. So here's an example of a request uh, from a user looking for orange tiger pillow. This second picture is an example of SQL I sending an unusual request to the back end. If the web server passes this request along to the database server, it'll look more like this. If it's successful, the, uh, the database will run two queries separated by the semicolon. The first would retrieve the product information and the second would retrieve a list of customer names and credit card numbers. And mind you, SQL is very much um, vulnerable to this without proper configuration. There's blind content-based SQLi. In this attack, a perpetrator sends input to the web app to see if it's interpreting injected code before attempting to carry out an attack. In this example, a web app asks for a user account number. When a user enters an account number into the page, they will see a list of the information associated with that account. An underlying query could be something like that. The account field is populated from the input field. A SQL I attack could be adding something like this so that the query looks like that. This query would match all results. However, the design of the web app may ignore queries beyond the first row. If so, it would display the same result as earlier. Though the attacker may not be able to see the results of the query, it doesn't mean the attack was unsuccessful. 
Receiving no results makes it difficult to initially distinguish between a well-defined, well-defended application or a successful attack. The attacker could try again with a known account number using a SQL that modifies the query to return no results, something like that. The query above will not return results because one is never equal to two. If the application returns nothing, they can be reasonably sure that the application is vulnerable to blind SQLi and attempt more malicious queries to alter the contents of the database or perform other unwanted actions. There is also the blind timing based SQLi depend on delay mechanisms offered by different platforms. For example, Microsoft has a function that waits 15 seconds before performing the next action. An attacker seeking to verify whether an app is vulnerable to time-based attacks could provide something like this. And an application that immediately returns results is not vulnerable to this type of attack. Though this may seem like a strange attack using time, uh, it can extract useful information. If a database table contains an unencrypted field name called passwords, let's say, an attacker could use this uh, attack to discover passwords by checking letter by letter. A different type of injection is command. In some cases, web apps may execute a command within the operating system, which is totally dangerous because you can manipulate the underlying OS. Something like this, inputting it into the username or being able to remove a home folder should not be able to not only be taken, but be executed by a web app. But it happens. There's web applications that have a direct connection to the underlying OS for whatever reason. Passwords are by far the most common form of authentication and the most easily defeated as they are knowledge-based authentication technique. An attacker who learns a user's password may impersonate the user until the password is expired or changed. Passwords can be learned through technical ways like wiretapping, a dump of the passwords or brute force, through social engineering, fake websites, spam, and other means. Developers make, it, make life easy uh, by shipping systems with default administrative accounts. There's also session attacks. Credential stealing attacks allow a hacker to authenticate directly to a service using a stolen account by uh, different approaches. They may not, they don't require an attacker to gain access to, a, to the authentication mechanism. Instead, they take over an already authenticated session with a website. Most sites that require a username and password, I use cookies, which are saved in the browser and transmitted as part of the header. If those can be captured or stolen, then the attacker can basically do a session replay and pretend to be the legitimate user and get access to whatever that user has access to just by being able to steal the cookie. Some web applications allow the browser to pass destination URLs to the application and then redirect the user to that URL. This would allow uh, the user to a thank you page at the end of the transaction. While this is convenient 
for developers to modify the destination page without altering the application code, it does create an unvalidated redirect situation where an attacker could easily redirect to a malicious site. So again, just because it's convenient doesn't make it secure. Speaking of insecure, here are other authorization vulnerabilities. There's the insecure direct object reference. In some cases, web developers make an app that directly retrieves information from a database based on an argument provided by a user in a query string or a post request. While there is nothing wrong with this approach, as long as the application applies other authorization mechanisms, because the attacker can easily view that URL and modify it to get other information. If there are no other authorization checks, then it could be very easy to just do this and get more information that exceeds the authority of the, of the primary user. There's also directory transversal. Some web servers have a misconfiguration that allow users to navigate the directory structure and access the files. Being able to access the operating system files, the ones on disk that aren't stored wherever the website is, but able to move around. Using the URL at the bottom here, a misconfigured web app would bring out the contents of the Etsy shadow file, which is not good. There's also file inclusion. File inclusion executes code contained within a file, allowing the attacker to fool the web server into executing arbitrary code, either locally, if the file is already on the web server, or remotely by having a file downloaded and executed in the web server. Usually, attackers exploit this to get a web shell in order to run more commands on the server and view the results in the browser. This can happen on HTTP or HTTPS, and attackers could seek to repair the initial vulnerability to prevent other attackers or teams from getting notified of the successful attack. There's your local example, running a file that is on the local system and running one that's on another web server. Oh, the last one that I don't have a picture for is privilege escalation. Getting, are you running an exploit in order to get a, uh, a user account and then moving up? to a root or a super user account. The next a couple of items are all exploiting web application vulnerabilities. Cross-site scripting or XSS occurs when a web application allows an attacker to perform HTML injection on a web page. This is an example here of a reflected cross-site scripting. It occurs when an app allows reflected input like hello and then a, a specific name. An attacker can utilize the script tags, the HTML script tags used uh, in order to trick the browser into doing something it shouldn't on a web page. An attacker could create a web page that loads a real web page, but executes the script included in the input by a malicious user, like being a keylogger, for example. Developers should always perform input validation. They should have 
applications determine the type of input that will be allowed and validate to ensure it matches the pattern. Like if a, uh, a form is asking for age, then it really should only accept one to three digits and everything else should be rejected. There's the stored or persistent cross-site scripting, storing XSS code on a remote web server, inserting an HTML script within the code, causing future visitors to see a message, but it could be as dangerous as redirecting to a phishing site, requesting sensitive information or uh, so much more. There's also the cross-site request forgery and the server-side request forgery. While these are similar, to cross-site scripting, but the attack uh, is on the remote site that have a user system to execute the commands on the user's behalf. XSRF attacks work by the assumption that users are often logged into many different websites at the same time. Attackers embed code in one site that sends a command to a second site. When the user clicks on the link to the first site, they unknowingly launch a command on the second. This is where things like secure tokens that uh, that attacker would not know embedded in links, checking the referring URL from the end users and make sure that they are originating from the correct site. The server side request forgery tricks a server into visiting a URL based on the user supplied input. SSRF attacks are possible when a web app accepts URLs from a user as input and then retrieves information from that URL. If the server has access to non-public URLs, an SSRF attack could unintentionally disclose information to an attacker. So some application security controls that we should all be aware of. There's the input validation, the most effective form being input whitelisting or input blacklisting, saying what can be accepted and what cannot be accepted. There's the web application firewalls working at the application layer, sitting in front of a web server and receiving network traffic that's headed to that server, scrutinizing the input before it goes to the web server. For databases, there's things like normalization, preventing data inconsistency, preventing update anomalies, reducing the need for restructuring existing databases and making the schema more informative. Parameterized queries, not sending SQL code directly to the database server. They'll send arguments, which are then inserted into pre-compiled query templates. Obfuscation and camouflage, for example, Data minimization, not collecting information that's, that's not necessary. There's tokenization, replacing uh, personal identifiers with unique strings in a lookup table. And there's hashing, replacing sensitive information with an irreversible alternative identifier. For code, we have code signing in order to confirm the authenticity of the developer's code. There's code reuse. Security professionals should be familiar with the various ways that third-party code is used in their organization, as well as the ways the organizations make services available to others. 
like getting code out of Stack Overflow. It is fairly common for security faults to arise in shared code. So knowing about what dependencies exist in the code and uh, being vigilant about those updates is important. Your software diversity. Watch for places in the organization that are dependent on a single piece of source code. There's the code repos, you know, performing version control, getting rid of dead code. There's integrity measurement, using cryptographic hash functions to verify the code being released into production matches the one approved. There's application resilience, being able to scale, and elasticity, being able to be provisioned or deprovisioned whenever necessary. Some good practices, having comments, ensuring that the commented version of the code remains secret. The compiled code should automatically remove all comments. Web apps that expose their code may allow remote users to view those comments. Error handling. Attackers thrive on exploiting errors in code. Developers must anticipate unexpected situations and write code that steps in and handles errors in a secure fashion, like not giving out what operating system, what version, what uh, everything out. Uh, in the air. Getting rid of hard-coded credentials. These show up all the time, and Cisco tends to be a big one that keeps getting caught for having default credentials in their equipment. But it's not just Cisco. A lot of folks put their API keys and credentials into things like GitHub. For memory, there's the resource exhaustion. Intentional or accidental, systems may consume all memory storage and processing time, rendering the system disabled or crippled. Memory leaks is one example uh, of resource exhaustion. There's pointer dereferencing. Memory pointers are an area of memory that store an address of another location in memory. Attackers can use null pointers or empty pointers to cause an application to crash, getting that debugging information that will be useful for things like reconnaissance or bypassing security controls. There's the good old buffer overflow. Manipulating a program into placing more data into an area of memory than, is, than what's allocated to rewrite other information in memory and get execution that way. There's the race conditions. When a program access permissions too far in advance of a resource request, developers should evaluate access permissions at the time of each request rather than caching a list of permissions. There's another acronym you should be familiar with. It's uh, called TALK2, which is time of check to time of use. That shows up on tests. Unprotected APIs can lead to unauthorized use of functions, like modifications of services. API should not be public use. They should have authentication mechanisms and be accessible over encrypted channels. And there's also driver manipulation. Uh, these device drivers who require low level access to the operating system and run with administrative privileges are a normal target. Attackers could wrap malicious 
code within a driver and sending it along. So when that driver gets installed, the malicious code is with it and has that high level of privilege and will be able to run and provide a, an access way for the attacker. While most operating systems do block malicious drivers, it's not at all foolproof. Any questions? Isn't this fun stuff? Let me share my screen again to the work for this week. I'll just share my desktop. So this week, you will be doing two main things. The first of which is going to application security and checking out these, uh, these awesome walkthroughs. They, they can be done completely in the browser without any extra tools. So I pointed a few out like SQL I, command injection, directory transversal, so on and so forth. So for example, uh, I'll switch over to command injection. This is awesome, especially for those who have never done anything with web application stuff. So it's 13 pages. It, tell, it gives you something to read, gives you a little story about what's happening or what you're gonna be doing. It tells you where to click and what to do, like down here. You click on stuff, you copy things. It, take, it walks you step-by-step step in an example of the thing you're reading about. Perfect for those getting started. The next thing you'll do is pick three of the learning materials listed above, SQL I, command injection, directory traversal, so on and so forth. And go through the Web Security Academy. Web Security Academy has all kinds of web related things to learn. So I pointed out a few you can pick from those if, if others catch your attention. So I kind of did the command one. There should be a command one in here somewhere. Yeah, or it's command ejection. So you do the, the command one in application security. You can also do the command one here in uh, the web application, uh, web security academy, sorry. This gives you more of a hands-on where you're connecting to a system and you're running these commands and there's labs here for you to do. If you get stuck for whatever reason, it's perfectly fine, by the way, to look at the solution. You now you're gonna access a lab that tells you to solve it. You, I wanna execute who am I in order to name the current user. If you get stuck, there's community solutions and their solution to look at. Do not feel bad at all about looking at those if you get stuck. And there's all kinds of things that you can do to dig further into it. So if, you're, if you want to do command uh, injection, you would do the application security one and then also do it here as you go through these labs doing all kinds of things like exploiting, uh, detecting, injecting and so on and so forth. Uh, yes, to be, to confirm, 
You should not be doing any of the paid. Do all the free. And yes, there are so many because there's so many ways to exploit web applications. And that's the whole point of this is to help you to see. So first you'll do a bunch of these in the application security where everything is sandboxed and you don't have to do anything other than following the directions and reading through. So you find three that you really like and do those three in here. So you can, so you can dig further into the things you like. Does that make sense? Because yeah, it would suck to make you do things that, that bore you. Like if SQL I bores you, then don't do that. At least you saw it. You went through it in application security. And then you're like, yeah, SQL I is not for me, but I want to do direct reach is versal. So go do that. There's plenty of labs that'll give you lots of hands-on into this realm. So that is really the, the work this week. And before we take off, uh, I saw a message on Discord of a student asking uh, Karen how she, how she killed the, the scores. So Karen, if you want, you could either type what you did or, or use the mic. Uh, you don't have to uh, turn on your camera. I, I can talk about it. Um, first of all, I'm really sorry again for, for accidentally killing that. Um, I hope nobody lost points over it. And if you did, I hope you were able to get them back easily. Um, in, in analyzing what happened, um, I found two vulnerabilities, but, but first, let me talk about what I was doing. I was launching a dictionary based brute force attack against the web form using Hydra in order to try to brute force the answer for one of the questions that I didn't know the answer to um, that I was having trouble with. And um, unfortunately, I hit a race condition in the um, in the code. Um, the, the source code for the web form um, does not lock the file that our, our point scores are stored in when it accesses it. And so I hit a race condition um, where, because Hydra launches multiple um, versions of itself at the same time to, in order to act faster. I, I think uh, my Hydra uses like 16 um, uh, children simultaneously. Um, and so they hit the form at the same time and caused um, the, the CSV file to get erased. Um, that was made possible because several of them hit correct answers at the same time due to a different vulnerability where the um, web form is checking for the an correct answer to be included in the string of our answers that we submit, instead of being identical to the string um, of the answer we submit. Um, so because of that, when I was doing a dictionary attack, um, a whole bunch of words in a row ended up being correct. And that's what caused me to hit the race condition because um, so many of them were trying to write to the CSV file at the same time. Um, Amusingly enough, uh, this problem also makes the form vulnerable to a true dictionary attack. Um, if you just paste the entire dictionary into the answer field, um, as long as it's a single word answer, or uh, you, you should be uh, getting the, uh, a correct answer if you just paste the entire dictionary into the web form. So if you're, if you're curious of trying this out yourself, the thing I will warn you is DigitalOcean does a backup. I think it's on Thursday. So uh, the, the last backup I have was of the 17th, and that's what I restored. 
So anything that you did be between Thursday and, and Sunday, was it when you killed it? I think so. So Maybe. anything between there, things are gone. So if you do it, if you do the attack now and you erase the thing, well, then we're just going to have to go back to last Thursday. So uh, uh, try it at your own risk because you might just nuke yourself. Uh, actually, I've, I've since uh, set up a LAMP server uh, or a LAMP VM, and I have a version of the web form running on my LAMP VM so I can hack on it um, and try things <laughs> out without uh, killing everybody's <laughs> scores. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It happens. But yeah, yeah, I, I noticed that DigitalOcean only backs up on the weekend. So if you if you uh, kill it during the week, everybody just has to go back to whatever last backup I had. But hey, you're not learning if you're not hacking. So it's all good. Um, any questions? Thank you, Karen, for sharing. You're welcome. And I'm definitely learning from the experience. <laughs> As you should, as everybody should. Any other questions? If not, then let's like uh, make like trees and leaf. Uh, once again, happy hacking as you attack all kinds of web servers. And feel free to always reach out on Discord if and when you get stuck. Always, always reach out on Discord. Do not feel that your question is silly or dumb. Ask there. That's why we're all doing this. That's why you're in a class. You work together. Working together is always encouraged in my classes, not like other classes where it's not. It's perfectly fine to work together. I did have one question. Um, I was looking ahead at the homework for module eight. 